Okay. Hi, folks. Yay. Um, okay, I got up at half past two this morning, so I'm still pretty confused. I've had a coffee just now, so that will hopefully get me through the next 40 minutes. But you know, just, to, just to check, it's Monday, yeah? We're in Hailey, yeah? Um, and Theresa May is still the Prime Minister of Great Britain at the moment, yeah? If someone could tell me if that changes in the next 40 minutes, that'd be good to know. Um, okay, I've put this, uh, oh, it's a bit brighter pink than, uh, than it is on my screen. Um, I've put this as the first and last slide of both today and tomorrow, and it's, yeah, unless people say you really shouldn't do that anymore, I'm probably going to do it from now on. Uh, I was speaking at Caribbean Dev Developer Conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I said, I don't need any slides at all. It's fine. And the organizer said, well, we've got to have something behind you. Would you like your profile? It's like, no, that's the worst thing. No, definitely not. Uh, just put be kind up there. And I've started to think that's probably the most important thing I can say. So I'm going to be saying it at the start and end of everything. And if you take one thing away, it's let's be kinder to each other. OK. Um, however, you probably came here not to be uh, encouraged to be kind, but for um, client library design. And the Google API part of this is almost entirely incidental. It so happens that's what I've been doing for the last uh, about three years at work. Um, but it's really just what I've been learning about API design. And particularly, there are some aspects that apply particularly to um, API client libraries. But hopefully, there are bits that you can take away. Most talks that I give, I have specific messages. You know, my talk tomorrow, there will be definite, this is a bad idea to do this with date and time. This is a good idea, that kind of thing. Uh, today will be very much up to you. You've got to do half the work here, OK? I can tell you what I have learnt, but I can't tell you how much of it applies to what you do. So you need to really reflect. So I'm sorry if you come for a sort of afternoon bit of a doze. Um, in order to get anything out of this, you're going to need to do some work as well. Let's look a little bit at the history of .NET client libraries for Google Cloud Services. And by cloud services, that is any kind of service that Google is running in the cloud with a public API. So that could be the YouTube API. It could be Google Cloud Platform, which is sort of uh, they pay my bills, as it were, but I kind of work on the gamut of uh, all APIs. So it could be calendar, could be Gmail, could be contacts, uh, could be ML-based you know, speech, vision, etc. And a very, very long time ago, in fact, when I first joined Google, I used to be a client myself of the GData API uh, for calendar, uh, which is how I got into date and time things. And that was gradually replaced for almost all APIs anyway uh, with REST-ish and JSON. So you can send HTTP 1.1 requests with JSON and you'll get some JSON back. And it's not very dogmatic REST. It's kind of REST-like, um, REST-inspired, let's say. And we have a bunch of auto-generated libraries in multiple languages, um, including C Sharp. And that was done for quite a while on a sort of 20% basis. So it was a best effort. Let's kind of do the best we can, support as many APIs as we can. Um, and it's all based on generated code with a couple of support libraries. And then a couple of years ago, a few years ago, um, Google invented gRPC, uh, which sort of stands for Google RPC or possibly general RPC. I'm not, not quite sure. But it's an open source project and consortium and, and things. Um, and there's this idea that internally, we certainly build services as RPCs. And we were exposing them as a bit REST-like. And there was a bit of an impedance mismatch. So we've been trying to reduce that impedance mismatch um, and have a common set of design patterns that all new APIs follow and conventions. We'll talk a little bit more about the conventions later on. And now new APIs that come out generally support, you can still post 
um, JSON to them and get JSON back, or you can use gRPC, which is you know, traditional RPC things based on protocol buffers. Just a binary serialization protocol. That's all you need to know about protocol buffers for this talk. So the important thing is we've got some old libraries that support all the APIs. And most of my work is spent building new libraries to support the gRPC flavor of APIs. Um, and that this causes confusion for users because there are two different NuGet packages you could use to talk to the same thing, at least two. If there have been different versions around, and I'll come to versions later on, there might be multiple. Um, and my instruction to be kind sort of applies to me and my team as well. We're trying to be kind to our users. Um, and I guess that's what good API design is being kind to your users. But these are the problems that we face before we've written any lines of code, you know, we know that we've got old stuff that we still want to support, new stuff that wants to be bright and shiny, and there will be trade-offs between them and you know, of trying to avoid user confusion. So I mentioned versioning, um, and this is one of the things I have been learning more and more about and panicking more and more about um, over time, because in the .NET space, we don't really have a very good versioning story. I mean, aside from uh, the versions of .NET Core and ASP.NET Core and .NET Standard, I was involved, I was privileged to be in the um, one of the video conferences where the uh, version number for the next version of .NET Standard was being discussed. It's like, well, if we, have, if we make that .NET Standard 2.1, but .NET Core 2.1 doesn't support it, that's going to really confuse everyone. OK, well, we could call it .NET Standard 2.2, but then people might expect that to ship with .NET Core 2.2. Is there going to be a .NET Core 2.2 back in the time? So there are problems in terms of just working out what version number to use. And if you are deciding a version number, this is something you need to think about really, really hard. And then there's the whole separate technical aspects. So we kind of like to think we support semantic versioning uh, in .NET, in NuGet packages, which means that you, know, you can make breaking changes between version 1 and version 2. Uh, you will only make minor changes, so backward compatible changes between 1.0 and 1.1 and 1.2, etc., and patch compatible changes for you know, 1.1.1 to 1.1.2. And the way I like to think of is something, a minor version bump or a patch version bump, is you should be able to roll back a patch if it turns out that the bug that it fixed was something that it turns out you were relying on. It should be fine to roll that back. And even if you've been building new code on top of it for six months, you should still be able to roll it back and things should still be able to compile. No new API surface, no API surface changes at all, purely implementation. OK, so what version numbers do we use? Here's an example of something I released last week. So Google Cloud Storage v1, version 2.3.0 beta 4. This is deliberate, and this is a feature, not a bug. It's just a feature I need to explain. <laughs> um, and that's immediately a barrier to entry. You know, I've raised the bar. To understand how to use my client libraries, you need to understand this versioning to some extent. Or you just pick the thing that starts Google Cloud Storage and ignore the .v1. But the thing is, we've got two version numbers here. This is version 2.3 beta 4 of the library that supports the API Google Cloud Storage v1. Okay, We did have a v1 of this, and we made a tiny, tiny backwardly incompatible change. Probably wouldn't have broken anyone, but we thought you know, we'll be really good citizens and bump up to version 2. There might be a Google Cloud Storage v2 at some point, at which point we'd have Google Cloud Storage v2 version 1. Because we're separating out the API that we're talking to and the version of the library that we're implementing. And keeping those independent has proved to be, I believe, the right decision. 
it means that suppose you have an application that depends on Google Cloud Storage v1, and we release v2, and you think, yay, I want to use that. Uh, I've got this bit of my application that, should, uh, that would really benefit from that. That's fine. You could use Google Cloud Storage v1 for 90% of your app, and the new bit of your app, you could use Google Cloud Storage v2. They would be entirely separate types. Everything would be fine. On the other hand, if you do want to upgrade your whole application, you can do it piecemeal, um, but you will need to tweak every bit of code, at least the using directives. So there are pros and cons, and aside from be kind, one of the takeaways here is API design is full of pros and cons. You regularly have to make a choice, and it's almost never between two fantastic options. It's always between two options that you don't really like either of them, or you know, far more than that. It's between awful, I can't possibly inflict this on my users, and OK, I'll have to hold my nose and hope that they don't kill me. So already, I've got something that I don't like confusing my users, but I couldn't find any better option. I mentioned semantic versioning and being backwardly compatible. Um, it turns out we don't really know what this means very well. So it would be nice if we could uh, ship version 1 and then add some features and ship version 1.1. How many of you are confident that you know what that means you can do within your code base? OK, that's the right answer. <laughs> Let me, if I can, switch to Visual Studio. Oh, OK, let me try. This is where I want it to be in duplicate mode for, um, for code and in extend mode for the, the slides. So let's, let's suppose we have a class, you know, cool library class. Um, and it's got a method. So this is public foo int x. OK, so this is in version 1.0. 1.0. OK. So we clearly can't, for v1.1, rename that to bar. OK. Can we all agree that would be a breaking change? Yep. OK. The, the, um, the rules for definitely breaking are fairly simple. Um, we could possibly add, whoopsie. Add a different method. That might break some people, because they might have an extension method that targets a uh, cool library class already. So you know we're already in the gray area. What about if we add this as an overload? How many of you just let's just accept that some of these things where I asked you to put up your hands, you're likely to be wrong in my view. And that may well be not wrong anyway. So how many of you think this, this is an OK, a non-breaking change? OK. And how many of you think it's are sufficiently confident that it's a breaking change, you could give an example of code that it would break? Ooh, just two. Let me give you an example in. Um, So obviously, imagine this was in a different project. Um, static void break me. I have a little um, open source project that makes this kind of uh, thought experiment easier to conduct. In one single file, you say, here's the library before, here's the library afterwards, here's some client code. Please compile the old library code, compile the client against it, and run it compile the new library code, rerun the client without recompiling, and capture the output, then recompile the client and run it a third time, and let's see whether things change. Um, and in almost all cases, they do. So suppose we had var, uh, what did I call this? 
CLC is new cool library client, library class rather. Okay, if I do CLC dot foo five, that's fine. That's going to do exactly the same afterwards uh, in in v one point one as as in one point zero. Um, if I put a string, then that wouldn't compile in one point zero, uh, but it would in one point one. If I use a default literal, that becomes ambiguous. Thank you, C sharp seven, I think it was that introduced this. So, um, in fact, this is probably telling me, oh, it's it's even C sharp seven point one. So, a bigger point here is there are things that you might consider to be backwardly compatible, um, and then you find that the language has changed under your hood. So your previously backwardly compatible change between 1.0 and 1.1 may have broken one of your users because of a language feature that didn't exist when you released 1.1. Do you see what I mean, that versioning is hard? Um, so now that really should be compiling, or other. How have I not? Lang version latest. Okay. I won't stress this, um, but if anyone spots where I've got a typo or anything, then fine. Um, let's just comment it out for the moment. So I specifically had a slide for overloading um, because overloading is the nexus of all evil in uh, C Sharp. Um, every language feature ends up, yep, yeah, actually do it. I should get the notes, you should get the slide, not the other way around. Let's see. No, okay, this is, let's just go with duplicate and I'll manage without notes. It'll be fine. Yes. Right. Um, overloading is just horrible when it comes to versioning and introducing any new feature. Uh, unfortunately, it's a really, really useful feature in itself. So I can't imagine a new sort of successor to C-sharp coming out without overloading, but it really does make life really hard. Um, so that's just one example of where breaking changes are very, very hard to work out. So there are things that are obviously breaking, but sooner or later you're going to have to decide, this is something that could theoretically break some users. Am I going to view it as breaking or not? If it only breaks code that was already broken, so... <coughs> Before we had the default literal, we still had null. So you could overload something between, say, string and a resource name type, which I'll explain in a minute. And the only value that is valid for both of those is null. If my code already throws an exception, if you pass in null, then I can only break code that is already broken. It may break someone's unit tests. If it breaks their actual code, then you know, it's just changing where the error came. Is that okay? I think it probably is, but it's your choice to decide. API versioning, so the, the V1 part of Google Cloud Storage, this isn't really a library decision, but it's something that I've been working on personally, so I thought I'd lob it into the talk. Um, API versioning doesn't make nearly as much sense in terms of semantic versioning unless you really want to run servers that implement, you know, this, this endpoint implements 1.0, this implements 1.1, this implements 1.1.1. Do you want anyone running against an unpatched version which presumably has a bug in? <coughs> um, there are ways of doing this you could put a version header on, and if you've only ever added fields in terms of what you accept and what you return, you can strip bits off a request or augment the request and strip bits off the response. But in terms of version numbers that we advertise within Google, we have decided that your major version number is kind of it for GA, general availability releases. So this V1 here is what most people are going to be using before that's first launched, we'd have a V1 Alpha 1, V1 Alpha 2, and those will have different endpoints or at least different paths within you. Know, you could have one server that supports V1 Alpha 1 and V1 Alpha 2, and they would be different RPCs. And in gRPC, they would have different protobuf packages. On REST, they would have different URLs for the endpoints. 
but then we launch V1, and then for a small subset of customers who are really interested, we'll give them V1 P1, because we can't put a, a point in protobuf packages, so you know, that, that's got to be a P1, you could read it as point one, V1.1, alpha one, um, but it never ends up as just V1 P1. When we've decided on the new features we're gonna launch, that just gets rolled into V1. So where there's Google Cloud Storage V1, and we've got some other things like Google Cloud Firestore V1 Beta 1, you'll never see, assuming we don't change our minds, you'll never see Google Cloud Storage V1 P1 as a package name. <coughs> um, you'll see V1 P1 Alpha 1 if we go public with a pre-release. If you're supporting a public API, if you're writing the back-end side, you may want to do this versioning scheme. You may want to do some other versioning scheme. What you should not do is just default it to whatever makes sense to someone on a Friday afternoon. Okay? It should be a deliberate decision. <coughs> um, and then I talked about backward compatibility from a C-sharp point of view. What does it mean in terms of an API? Maybe adding a field in a response, that sounds like it should be non-breaking, right? Yeah. Everyone will just ignore it if they didn't know about it before until you find out that someone's running a client on a Raspberry Pi or something, or an Arduino, you know, something with really, really very little memory, and suddenly your response doesn't fit in memory anymore. Is it breaking change? Well, it breaks somebody. Um, but backwards compatibility is much more of a spectrum than we may previously have thought. <coughs> I mentioned before that uh, within Google, we're paying a lot more attention to having some conventions around our APIs now. Now, there are two quite distinct but really important reasons for this. Firstly, uh, it's better for you. So even if you talk very directly to our APIs, if you don't use my client libraries at all, you post raw bytes, um, use Postman or whatever, it's really helpful for you if we've labeled, we've called everything similar names everywhere. We don't want to be using ID in some places, name in some places, you know, show in some places, get in other places. <coughs> Excuse me, I do apologize about all the coughing. If, if there's any bottle of water around, that would be great. Um, I can't see one lying around here. Anyway, <coughs> so conventions are great for humans because you'll know what to expect. As I mentioned, a lot of our libraries are generated code. If the API follows some conventions and we can explain those conventions to the code generator, we can then go ahead and use those within the code generator to make everything make more sense. And I've got two good examples of that. One is uh, list operations. So for example, you're using Google Cloud Storage and you want to list the buckets in your project. You call list buckets, you pass in your project name, and you might have thousands of buckets. So we don't necessarily give you back all of them at a time. Instead, we use a paginated approach. So if you've done any API stuff, this is you know, very basic and probably everyone does it slightly differently. Um, but we give you back, here are the, the first 10 buckets and a token, just an opaque, and we make it as opaque as we possibly can so that you can't try to reverse engineer the format and do weird stuff and start depending on things that will later change. Um, and you can provide that token. Thank you ever so much. Um, well, you can provide that token to a subsequent request and get the next 10. And then we give you back another page token and get the next 10, etc. And that all works, and we've been doing that for ages. But every one of you needs to write that while loop that says, you know, OK, I'm trying to get all of them, and I will stop if I run out of time or whatever. So I'll write a while loop saying, while there is a page token, meaning there are more results available, I will make the next call. Well, we don't need to do that. 
because our newer code generators understand the conventions, understand the semantics of the list operation where there's a page token and the next page token and the page size and things, we can just give you an innumerable of buckets and we'll just make the requests when we need to. If you want to get the original RPC responses, we can expose those instead and you could even iterate over those pages. And that's fine. Um, but we can only do that because we know the semantics. Another convention we have is for something called long-running operations. So there's uh, some things that you could do, like reboot or, or create a VM. That takes a little while. You probably don't want to wait for an RPC to finish for the, for the VM to be created or started or whatever it is. Or maybe it's creating a Kubernetes cluster. <coughs> Instead, um, we want to say, OK, you've started this operation. Here's a token. And you can ask whether that operation has finished at any time, which is sort of the API equivalent of a task of T. A task is just a token representing some ongoing operation. And because we know that this is a pattern that multiple APIs can use, we can put more effort into making that really easy to use. We can say, OK, pull this just once, <coughs> and we'll give you back the current state, and then make it easy to pull again. Or we can say, oh, just pull it repeatedly. Give us some rules for how often you want us to pull, when you want us to stop, give us a cancellation token, whatever it is, because we understand the semantics. So again, if you're in the position of providing um, an API, Consider what conventions could be useful to both humans and machines. <coughs> Slightly differently, different languages have different idioms. Uh, I don't think our teams were nearly as aware of this at the start as we are now. I've mentioned resource names a couple of times, and I want to show you an example. So. <coughs> We have resource names in multiple um, APIs, and they're, they're basically the way that you refer to anything these days. So within Spanner, Cloud Spanner, our database, um, we could have project slash my project ID <coughs> slash instances slash my instance. Ah database is my database ID. And this is what the, uh, what the RPC will actually take. It takes this as a string. <coughs> and we found we did usability studies with our initial generation of libraries. I think it was for PubSub. And we found that for the dynamic languages, most people were happy with this. They knew if they were going to pass in a string, they would consult the documentation and just do whatever formatting they needed to. .NET and Java developers said, I need to pass in a string. I don't know what to pass in. Head explodes. Um, <coughs> what really opened my eyes was we gave them samples to start with in some of these usability studies. And we would have a sample that had something like um, string project ID equals you know, X, Y, Z. And then I'm just going to comment out this project name, uh, string project name equals. And then it was something, this won't compile now, but it was something like publisher dot project name dot format project ID. Okay, that's how you could, if you wanted to do it by hand, sorry, if you wanted to do it in a slightly helpful way, you could convert a string that's just the project ID into project slash project ID. And if there were multiple parameters, so you know you might have project ID, uh, instance ID, etc. And we gave samples that had that line of code and then passed that to um, another method. And we said, right, now can you do something slightly different? And 
we saw people delete this line of code, and then they needed to call a method accepting a project name or an instance name or whatever. They say, I don't know what to do. Like, well, how about you just hit Control Z to start with? You have seen how to do this, but it, it just wasn't idiomatic. So we ended up generating, we now generate, um, for each of these kind of project, uh, these resource names, which refer to different types, they are effectively different types of identifier. Um, we generate a class that accepts all the right things and can parse things. So we have instance name, project name, database name, and we add extra bits onto the generated protobuf libraries so that instance dot instance name is of type instance name. Whereas if I just had instance dot name, so this is the, the property that protocol buffers is actually coming back with as a string. And we're just saying, well, you know, we can, we can get and set things and just wrap that in a much more pleasant type safe way. And I don't think the uh, Python and Ruby um, and Node code gen does that at all because people seem happy enough. So it's a matter of meeting developers where they are and not making an assumption that developers using one language will be satisfied um, with the solutions for another one. I mentioned that the instance name property was part of, was added to the protobuf generated type. So I've got a type that is just there for serialization, and we've added things. How do we add things? Partial classes. If you are doing anything with generated code in C Sharp and you're writing a code generator, then the big takeaway, if you aren't already doing it, is make everything partial. Just everything. Um, if you don't need it, if you don't use the fact that it's partial, that's fine, no one will care. But when you want it to be partial and it isn't and you've got to do a new version of the code generator, that's annoying. Um, generated, uh, sorry, uh, partial classes are really, really handy. They allow you to add a little bit like the semantics for list buckets and the long running operations. They allow you to add a bit more semantic information that you know as a human. And it's obvious as a human that you want that extra functionality, but it's something you would never want to put in the code generator. Let me give you an example with the Cloud Vision API. So the Vision API, this is our machine learning that can detect faces, labels, um, multiple objects, do um, OCR, all kinds of things. This is what you want to be able to do. You want to be able to say, get me a client, load an image from a file, and detect faces. Well, only the first line of that code would work with the normal code generator. We know how to create a client. That's kind of basics. <coughs> this is a static method that I added because you know, how is the code generator meant to know that for this particular serialization type, you very often want to load it from a file or load it from uh, somewhere on the web or possibly don't load it but embed the URL. There are multiple overloads here there's, uh, or multiple methods. There's from file. Um, fetch from URI and just from URI. So from URI will create something that when serialized and sent to the Vision API says, please you go and load it from this web server over here. Or you can say, oh, well, maybe it's an internal web server, so I will go and fetch it and then ship the bytes up. <coughs> and that's a reasonably specialized thing. You might be more surprised that detect faces isn't generated, you know, why wouldn't we have a detect faces method? Well, it turns out that the underlying RPC API for vision is simple slash complicated depending on your perspective. It's simple in that I think there are two RPCs. By now there may be rather more, but the main RPC is batch annotate images. So th these lines of code here, even if we had image.from file, without the partial stuff, would look more like this. 
And in fact, there's too much for me to show here. So the idea is you might want to do things with multiple images, and you might want to do multiple things with each image, you know, detect faces and detect labels and detect multiple objects and things. So from a pure API what goes on the wire perspective, it's really elegant to have one method that can do everything. It's a real pain if you're trying to use that because you have to create one request that says, I want to do face detection, then wrap that into a batch, call the batch annotate images, um, do things if there's an error. You know, this doesn't come back with an API error, you know, a 404, uh, 500 or whatever it is, because some images within the, within the batch may have succeeded. But given that we've only passed in one image, we probably want to throw an exception. So you've got to find that first response, check whether or not there's an error, and then you can finally get the face annotations. And I don't know about you, but I think I would probably rather just have detect faces and pass in one image. Okay? That's the power of partial classes. And I tell you, I loved showing the other language teams. You know, I, there are multiple teams working on different languages and the same clients for the same APIs. And not every language can do this very elegantly. And in particular, I don't think Java manages it terribly nicely. And it's just so nice to be able to say, isn't that lovely? So take advantage where you can. And you may not be doing anything with CodeGen at all. Um, but if you are, take advantage of not just, hey, we can get a load of stuff for free by generating things. That is great um, if you're ever building client libraries for APIs, you do not want to be doing everything by hand. But the things you can do by hand that can't be done automatically, they add huge amounts of value. So you're really maximizing um, your effectiveness. How am I doing for time? Four minutes. OK. Um, very, very briefly, this is another difference between the .NET libraries and some other libraries. <coughs> There are lots of layers um, involved in a lot of our code. So we have an ADO.NET provider for Spanner, and that talks to the bit more raw RPC layer that still has a session pool doing a lot of business logic in it. And then it has our GAPIC, you don't need to know, but that's one level of code generation that's got some of the goodies I've shown you, and that wraps the more raw just translate one RPC to one method kind of thing. This is grpc.spanner client. And then the requests and responses are just protobufs. Now, we made the decision right from the start that all those layers exist, and they are all public. If you want to go down to the absolute you know, build a request and response and send that over a socket yourself, you absolutely can. If you really just want to use the gRPC thing, you can. We kind of suggest that you probably don't want to, but it means that any time if a team adds uh, a field within a protobuf, I can just regenerate that protobuf, and anyone can get at it. Um, because even at the top level, maybe not for, for Spanner, but for the Vision API, for example, you, know, you get that face annotation. If that has been added to at all, you're looking at the raw protobuf. There's nothing extra to wrap. So this is what I call transparent layering. Other libraries have taken opaque layering, where each layer completely hides the layer below, which has other benefits. Um, if something has changed in a backwardly incompatible way at the RPC layer, but you wrap it in a backwardly compatible way higher up, you don't need to rev your version. Great. I would have to because I would expose that backward incompatibility. Again, it's something for you to think about when you do any kind of layering. And seeing as layering and abstractions are half of programming, it's just something to really consider. How transparent do you need to be? I have dependencies. <coughs> I will move swiftly through things. Um, we do all our development of this in the open. And so community is very important to us. 
I hope that if you're providing libraries, whether you're an individual uh, publishing NuGet packages or working for a company, um, and maybe you only have internal customers, you still have a community there. I want to say it is hard. It's hard to be a good open source owner because that doesn't always mean saying yes. People can make very, very reasonable feature requests. They might even create the pull request and say, hey, I've done all the work for you. Please just accept it and everyone will be happy. And sometimes you need to say, no, you would be happy now without me doing any work but it might well prevent something else good happening in the future. You know, maybe you've added a dependency on some other bit of code, and I don't really want to take any other dependencies because I don't know how they're going to pan out. I don't know whether they're going to be supported, all kinds of things. This is one of the things I have found hardest because you know, going back to the very first slide, I want to be kind, I want to help people, particularly if they're putting in effort as well. So saying no when that's the right thing to do, but for difficult reasons to explain, particularly if some of those reasons are actually historical. You, know, I've made a mistake before, which means the right decision now is to say no to you. That's not being mean. It can still be the right thing to do, but it is hard. Uh, I'm running out of time, so have good documentation, clearly. And you would be amazed at, A, how little documentation is around for many libraries, B, how people just don't read it anyway, um, and C, how we are still quite a long way, certainly in the .NET ecosystem, from having a standard, really well-lit path for multi-version supporting, um, very well-integrated documentation in all kinds of ways. Uh, DocFX is great but I think we still have a long way to go. And my personal bugbear, .NET Standard, as far as I'm aware, does not have a logging API, which makes it very, very hard for library authors to know what to do. So back to being kind. Uh, that was just a smattering of things I have learned. This could have been a, a three-hour presentation, and I would have just gone through individual chunks. I don't have a cohesive story for you to take away, I'm afraid. Some of this, if you're not doing code gen things, then my examples of partial classes will have been useless to you. Hopefully, at least one thing that I said was something that does apply to your work. If it doesn't, then if nothing else, be kind, but also take away the idea of reflecting on your own work. These are things that I didn't know would be this hard or I, I hadn't thought quite how awful versioning is in the past. Take away that idea of reflecting on what you have learned and who you can share it with, and be kind. Thank you. <laughs>